Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fan Fiction Tapes. I'm your host today, Maya, pronouns she, her, and I'm joined by... Dylan, returning. Finally, long-awaited, very awaited. Hi. Son. New face. And I'm a producer, Ian, and my pronouns are he and him. Today's episode is all about the fantasy genre, opening up our monthly theme for August. And to start this month off, first, we might want to talk about what even is fantasy, because it's kind of a nebulous genre. If I say fantasy, everyone usually thinks of something like Lord of the Rings, but that's not all that fantasy is. Well, it might seem, okay, it's easy. Something like Lord of the Rings. Defining it gets wiggly in the corners, as I wrote in my notes. Encyclopedia Britannica defines fantasy as, and I quote, imaginative fiction dependent for effect on strangeness of setting, such as other worlds or times, and of characters, such as supernatural or unnatural be uh, beings. I can words. Which is, uh, useful. Sure, we, we could call it that. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty broad, and Wikipedia isn't really much help here either which is unfortunate because Wikipedia is infinitely superior. Fantasy definitions can be kind of contentious, considering that something that might not at first thought be fantasy, like Star Wars when you first think of it, depending on the definition, count as fantasy. Start us off, Sun, how would you define fantasy? I... I mean, I think I kind of agree with that. What you just said is that it's super hard to define. It, it's because, uh, like, I mean, like the nature of things is the same magic. And the, the, okay, so where does that put something like Star Wars? Where does that put something like uh, the Greenbone Saga? Things like that. Uh, and truth be told, I think the biggest thing is it might be helpful to kind of look at what it's not. And from that point of view. You know, obviously, you can have some genre overlaps. You compare it to something like science fiction. Like, you have something like uh, Children of Time, which is far from future Earth, and that's, there's no magic involved, but it's a very strange world. It, it's basically a far future where the last few humans have come back to Earth after leaving Earth, and they discover, like, what the new species is that's kind of risen up in their place as the, the dominant sentient life form. Um, and so it, it, it kind of shows how inadequate with the strangest of setting is, because in this case, the strangest of setting is people come back expecting super intelligent apes, and they have instead have like jumping spiders that have evolved into a hive mind with human intelligence. Uh, you would you that sounds like something you see in like different types of fantasy, but it absolutely isn't. And I think we're uh, you do have to have something that kind of falls outside the scientific method for it to be considered fancy, because you know, Star Trek is that fantasy, is as a strange setting, but you don't really get into a lot of things that can be that can't be classified by the scientific method at one point, which and I kind of alluded to this prior to the show, if kind of getting ahead of myself here. I, I think it does have to have something that it cannot be explained by rational means. And you can you might be able to codify it to an extent, like in uh, something like the Stormlight Archive, or some people, somebody who's done some very hard magic, hard uh, world building. But ultimately, there needs to be something where you cannot, you cannot square it by rational means or measurement. That was very philosophical. <laughs> I tend to, it, it, I tend to kind of go in in loops when I think. Unfortunately, <laughs> that was all good. Uh, the thing that I really look for when I'm looking at, like, fantasy is sort of because, like, what, you don't really get a checklist of this is what makes it fantasy or not. It's like if we said, oh, as soon as you leave, like, the world of Earth or whatever and you leave, like, his, like canon history or whatever and you diverge, like, ah, oh, that's, you know, now it's not fantasy, but fantasy can obviously still be involved in Earth. It's usually 
the introductions of you know, other creatures, other beings to Earth, if you are using Earth as a setting, like in obviously most um, what you would describe as uh, fantasy settings that are like Harry Potter or urban fantasy stuff, usually they take place in like Earth or like an area where there is a hidden dimension or hidden world within Earth, you know. Like, mm-hmm. that's usually what you would find in that sort of way. And that's what I would classify. It, I think anything, when you relate back to Earth and introduce space, that's when you're like, oh, this is now sci-fi, <laughs> though. I don't think you can have, like, or it'd be very difficult to have, like, sort of a sci-fi in the Star Wars way, because... You're always gonna with a sh- like a universe like that. If you don't have Earth as the basis, then it's completely foreign and it's fantasy, right? I can kind of see that, but I mean, I'm kind of with two minds on that. On one hand, I, I do agree that having Earth as a grounding is kind of provides some basis for that. But on the other, it's like if you can, like I said, I think I'm just keep coming back to the whole explaining things rationally thing, like. Uh, to me, it's like a lot of people think fantasy needs some form of magic. Uh, well, I guess that's a that's kind of a good place to stop off. Do you think that's you think you can have a fantasy setting without any sort of active magic, whether it's you know, hard magic or soft magic? I'd say so. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, okay. Like, well, uh, the only thing that comes to mind right now is the movie A Bug's Life, which I haven't seen in probably something like. 10, 15 years. Eh, less than 15. I'm not old enough for that. Um, but it's inarguably a fantasy movie. It's got a bunch of talking animals as the main cast. Actually, talking insects as the main cast. That's true. And, you know, I'm going to be wrong on bug etymology. <laughs> okay, so fan fiction tape, not biology tapes. Oh, did, did did you not have something to interject with there, Ian? Oh, yes, I did. Um, you mentioned A Bug's Life. Um, I'd like to bring up Redwall. Mm. Redwall? Uh, I would have brought up Redwall, but for the fact that I know literally nothing about Redwall, <laughs> having been, like, the only person in my friend group to have not read it. So, the Redwall series has um, talking animals in a pastoral setting that resembles... Um, in medieval England, and there are right. okay. There's a trope called maybe magic, maybe mundane, where there are things that that happen in the setting that possibly are magic. Um, but for the most part, in Redwall, anything that appears to be magic or supernatural is pretty quickly revealed to be a a uh, con of some sort. Um, there's just like a couple instances of like prophetic dreams, but there's no sorcery. Um, I think that I that brings me to something that I think is a key aspect of fantasy. Actually, um, the other world of the setting needs to have significant elements that resemble elements of our past. I think that's a a key distinction between fantasy and science fiction, that fantasy in some way looks back, and science fiction looks to the future. Well, when you say looks back, like, does that mean, like, oh, if we make this look like, for example, I would say a fantasy you know, a modern fantasy, if you think about it, where it's just, like, suburbia, but there are orcs, there are elves. Like, that's still a fantasy. It's not looking back. It's looking at what we are now, but just introducing these elements and then adding, like, law and whatever. That's still a fantasy, in my opinion. Bright is a terrible movie. (laughs) (laughs) 
and, and the other thing about urban fantasy, is, admittedly, my experience and I consists of like the rest of the files and a couple other things here and there, but at least in my limited experience, urban fantasy tends to be like, yes, this is in a contemporary setting, but like it's either gets into the all myths are true bit of it where there's ties back to some previous mythological uh, story. Yeah. Or it's like, hey, like, we were actually, like, way more rides spread than we used to be, but we kind of fade into the shadows either because humans were persecuting us or, like, there was some solar eclipse event and magic left the world and now it's back, like, kind of like in, like in Shadowrun. So I think there's, e even if it's not the setting isn't looking back, it's still it is directly as, say, like a uh, traditional, like, sort of sorcery medieval or, like, Gaslight might be. There's still like it's taking some cues from it in some way. Yeah, exactly. Even even in urban fantasy settings, the fantastical elements are drawn either directly or indirectly from folklore. And usually in the cases where it's indirectly, it's because they're drawing from other fantasy sources that were themselves drawing from folklore or history. Oh yeah. That is interesting. Although perhaps we should talk a little bit less about sci-fi, given that that is going to be our theme for September. Well, there is a reason that we put these two next to each other. Yes, that is true. Um, we've talked a little bit about what is and isn't fantasy, and we've mentioned offhand something called urban fantasy, which is a subgenre of fantasy and a particular favorite of mine. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to kind of give our readers who are unfamiliar with the genre a bit of a brief introduction to that, uh, if you've read The Dresden Files, Percy Jackson, uh, American Gods, or the Artemis Fowl books, those are all urban fantasy novels. Um, I think technically Harry Potter is urban fantasy, but Harry Potter is cringe. <laughs> and even setting aside all the baggage it has... It, yeah. I'd say the focus is so much on the part of it that's in the magical world. It's contemporary, but I don't think it really qualifies as urban, except for, like, a couple bits here and there. Yeah. Yeah, I love that story could be, in the, like, based in, like, the 1500s. Oh, yeah. And you edit some things here and there, and you can, like, it doesn't need to be. <laughs> like, yeah. How often does, like, modern technology or like modernity in general come into it outside of the of like the first chapter of any uh, Harry Potter book. <laughs> the flying car is a plot point at one point. Sure, That's but you can just you can yeah. just edit to it to a flying carriage. <laughs> I yeah. yes yeah. yes, and also I think that's really the only that's really the only modern tech that plays like a major plot point. As, um, long, as long as she hadn't appeared with trains, yeah. you could do it. Like it doesn't need to be contemporary yeah. to modern times of when it was written like the yeah. 90s or whatever like as long as there's a train system that story can be written pretty much <laughs> you could even say the wizards invented trains if you wanted to and had trains before <laughs> the rest of you know i mean the human i mean world <laughs> given human ingenuity and also just kind of the fact that you can do... You, there's a lot of ways to boil water with magic. Um, I am certain they could make that work. This would, of course, require the uh, setting to be handled by a writer who is much more imaginative than Rowling, because, oh boy, there's so much inconsistency and uncreativity. Yeah, that kind of happens when you... Magic is applied. That kind of happens when you, yeah. If you're designing a, ma a world in which you're essentially designing a new form of combustion engine based off of magic, I would, it's not a combustion engine, but, a, you know, a, a, a new form of a steam engine that functions on magic, I would recommend consulting an engineer. But anyways... <laughs> I mean, weird point, but okay. <laughs> Speaking of consulting engineers, then, uh, at the risk of, like, trending too much into the sci-fi again, is steampunk fantasy. Ooh, I would generally call it fantasy. Yeah, I mean, what, like, it depends on if you think, like, 
what cyberpunk is because obviously do you consider that like Sh- sci-fi Shadowrun is, the shadow like... run is weird um cyberpunk but... is a subgenre of sci-fi i would say it is I, yes I say, and yeah. i don't want to get too much into to to punk genre discourse here because we do have an episode planned for that next month <laughs> Okay, so um, sorry guys, I we can't talk about anything because we may talk yeah. about it in the future. Uh, on, on the subject, but, but, mean, it, but in the interest of level, please, yeah. yeah. In, in the interest of also talking about things we can't talk about, but kind of going going right into other subgenres, we also have the whole the the split between high and low fantasy, and that's we can. I'll let y'all like dig into what that is like when you get to that episode but that tends to be a pretty big divide into you you can group you you look at it like the animal kingdom tree like at the very highest level you can group 99 percent of fantasy into some form of high or low depending on how closely you define those two terms um yeah. but they still count as subgenres so well there's so many fantasy and like you and like <laughs> you can make like a school card of you know the big, big fantasy bingo on uh, new world okay uh humans are called something else okay like you just go through it other <laughs> races you get you know you get your long-lived race that has trouble and whatever or you have the short Elves, one free space yeah. yeah so you get all all that you know very short race uh and then like magical items whatever ancient history prophecy is actually earth in the past like you get so many and i think what's like (laughs) you look at it and you sort of have there's a feeling to fantasy you know that there's things you don't understand there's like systems in place like even if we look at like low fantasy and stuff like that like if we look at like a song of ice and fire oh yeah they still have like birds that are taught to deliver messages <laughs> because that you know that's like one of the things you know which is like a great will building thing because it's like okay here's how they have superior you know uh, messaging to actual medieval europe and and that's pretty like that's what makes that fantasy because, it, like, if you picked a way at, like, A Song of Ice and Fire and be like, okay, how do we make this, like, just, like, an alternate medieval, like, Europe, Eurasia sort of thing, you you could do it. But that's the thing is you look at it and you don't notice it right away, though. And I think <laughs> a lot of stories are, like, you could consider them like, oh yeah, you are fantasy hiding in plain sight. <laughs> yeah, it sometimes can also be kind of fun to take the opposite of approach to that too, where like you reskin something that doesn't normally fall in the fantasy genre into a fantasy setting. Um, I don't know if that, that really counts as a subgenre, but it's uh, like uh, Joe Abercrombie, you did all the first law books, which if you like a song of ice and fire, should be in the shelf for Joe right now. Go read them. Uh, Basically, he, he's got nine like full length books in set in that universe. There's two trilogies, but in between the two trilogies are a series of standalone books. And basically, his publisher was like, "Hey, like, we need more books. Can you do can you do something for us?" He's like, "Uh, yeah, I got these ideas. My default folder, I'll knock them out." And they're basically all like non fantasy books, kind of transposed to fantasy genre. So you've got one that's a revenge thriller. Uh, one that's basically a war epic, kind of like Seven Samurai, and then you've got one that's basically just a western with swords. And it, it, so it's, I don't really know that that counts as a subgenre, but when you kind of reskin something that would be considered fantasy, I think you kind of get into that uh, that realm. So, how do you guys feel about sort of sci-fi fantasy, though? Like, when we talk about, like, mixing these two together, like, something that is primarily fantasy, but has, you know, the undertones of a sci-fi thing there, or the opposite way around, when you are talking about something like Star Wars, which is, like, um, 
you know, it's based in space and galaxy and, sh- you know, ships and whatever. But at the end of the day, it's about a bunch of wizards wielding swords of light and, you know, going on, like, the basing a religion on this unseen entity that they just have to kind of, you know, interpret. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I love kind of mixing and matching genre stuff, taking stuff that doesn't really properly belong in fantasy and mixing it around. That's why I love urban fantasy. Uh, and in particular, Dresden Files, because it's basically a series of detective novels, at least at first. It changes a little bit further on, but it starts off as detective novels that are in an urban fantasy setting, which we never defined, actually. Whoops. I mean, you can't. That's the thing. <laughs> well, to be, to, be, to, to be fair, we were trying to have a light touch to talk about the other subgenres, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think urban fantasy is actually easier to define than regular fantasy. I think it's quite easy to define. Yeah. But that might just be because I'm delusional. <laughs> no, no, you're right. It's like you you transpose like ordinary elements with magical or fantastical ones in a like I said, there is a fine line between contemporary and urban. But uh, it's contemporary fantasy with a focus on the 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 normal world and real locations, as opposed to Harry Potter, where it's like you can be read at any time. They just have a now ish. The world that things. The world that operations, the, the world of operation, there we go, that's the phrase I'm looking for, is our world, ostensibly, or something fairly similar to it in looks. Oh, yeah. And then there is layered on top, underneath, or maybe in between the world of the fantastical, whether that's literal or m- like in the cases of. Harry Potter, not Harry Potter, not Percy Harry Potter. Jackson, um, uh, City of Bones, or more metaphorical, as is the case with the Dresden Files. We've gotten this far into a show or like an episode about fantasy, and we haven't mentioned like one of the biggest franchises that literally has the word in its title. How? Oh, no. Do what? Do what? Do we not want to talk about the Final Fantasy? <laughs> See, okay, that's. I mean, honestly, I'm unqualified to talk about this one. Y'all look hell yeah. that better. That's. I, I I've never played uh, a Final Fantasy game. I'm Same. aware with some of the lore, but I haven't played any. Honestly, like when you were talking earlier about the sci-fi and fantasy uh, overlap, Dylan, I thought you were angling to bring up Xeno Gears. But, <laughs> I mean that is one, but that was originally a Final Fantasy game, if you want to know. Um, but right. I think the idea of Final Fantasy, obviously, like the first few Final Fantasies, mostly ones before seven, are all based in like mostly very close to what you think of normal fantasy, with some magical elements. You know, a little bit of like. Yeah, sort of industrialization stuff, you know. Yeah, you, you might get like a from what under from my little bit of knowledge, you might get like an airship or like an Escaflowne style mm-hmm. back, but that's about it. Yeah. Right? yeah, and then seven, you're thrown into like this huge, you know, city with reactors and stuff, and the world is very modern in like its weaponry, how people look, and everything, and that is sort of what Final Fantasy became for a while, and uh, it switches between the two, you know, often enough. You get the more modern cities, you get your more castle stuff. But I always find that interesting, how a fantasy series that stretches that much, that you can go from... uh, And Seven has a lot of sci-fi in it as well, and that's also very interesting. But I just think that... If you looked at, at every um, Final Fantasy game, it shows you the extent the fantasy can go. You know, if you look at the most fantasy game and the least fantasy game in that series, they're still both fantasy. And it's crazy how flexible fantasy is. Whereas I think, you know, when you look at other genres, like if you look at like uh, something like sci-fi, something like horror, you're dealing with something that's a bit more 
uh, I'm flexible, kind of. For the most part, yeah. I feel like you can... I feel like fantasy is something very flexible and you can apply to so much. Whether it's, like, a historical fantasy where it's, like, it's based in a time period like we've read about, but they add some fantastical elements to it. You know, even just taking, like, old fairy tales and recontextualizing them into actual history. Like, you get stuff like that, anyway. I do love some every method to group. Uh, but I think it really shows how flexible the genre is. Like, you can have something where it's like, yeah, we're in a world that has nothing to do with Earth. We have own languages, everything. Here's some unique races, unique law, thousands of years worth of law. Uh, and also, here is a story about a bat-looking creature that has to pay its taxes. Like, we can, we can do both of those and say, fantasy. <laughs> I mean, that actually works really well, too, because there isn't, like, part of, like, OG vampire lore that they're, like, obsessed with numbers and counting. <laughs> that kind of depends on which um, oh, that's right. it's sorry, vampire-like... I, uh, I keep forgetting uh, it's not just Romania, so that's right. Yeah. Um, I believe that that specifically applies to um, East Asian uh, hungry ghosts. Okay, but uh, it's funny you mentioned horror though, because like it, it's I don't. It, it's hard to kind of really do it well with fantasy, but dark fantasy where you got like a horror element to it can be really fun if you're into that sort of thing. It's it's harder because I think horror works best when you're introducing something strange to the natural world or you're grounding it entirely in the natural world because it's it's more frightening that way. It's kind of like how... Um, I, I've never watched any of the Hustle movies or like any of the nonsense in that genre, but like one of the directors made a comment once where it's like, yeah, like I, I show you something really gruesome and violent. That's... It's it's yeah it's unpleasant but like it's not you're not going to get the same reactions you will as like somebody like cuts their finger or like jams a nail into their foot because you're you're more likely to have more experience with something like that or something similar to it. like if you've ever seen a quiet place like there's this great and this is getting a little off track but there's this great five minute sequence or so where like you see a nail sticking up from a step and you just know oh, oh no it he's gonna step on it. And there's like 10 minutes of what's going to happen, what's going to happen, and then it finally happens. And since you cannot make sound, otherwise things will kill you in that movie, uh, you can understand just how completely uncomfortable that whole sequence is. So, and, and that's really grounded in something that's very plausible, like, to real world. So, that caveat said, I think it can be fun, like, when you do mix the genres there. Like, there's one, there's this... I need to read the next one in the series. There's this book called Aching God by a guy named Mike Shell, who, he hasn't read a lot of books, but for the tabletop crowd, he's written a lot of Pathfinder modules. And the entire first book is basically a retired adventurer who has PTSD from when he was, like, the sole survivor of this party getting murked in a dungeon. And basically, he gets kind of called back to, like, return a cursed artifact to a temple because... His daughter basically pulled the magical equivalent of going into the reactor Chernobyl and is now in a magic coma from saving people. So they're like, yeah, we need to we need you to go back and like face your PTSD and demons and yeah, and deal with this. And it's I, I don't write it easily, so I just kind of like the vibe because it's it, it allows some for some interesting character moments. But there are just some really, really just tension inducing moments when like building up through the entire book as they're like going to this this dungeon in this land of all these tombs that they uh they re that different people raided and you talk you they find the survivors there's from the last expedition that went there and they talk to two of them and it just it's it's kind of got this it's like a mystery but instead of like feeling like okay you're Pulling the thread, trying to ravel it. There's just like this great foreboding, and I think again, you need to. It's tricky to ground it, so a lot of it's grounded in his personal experiences and the fact that he's still having nightmares from his last outing like ten years ago. But it, it, when you strike the balance, it can be pretty compelling. 
That does sound like a fun read. Um, I will send it to you wait on the show notes. All right. Uh, I do have a wrench I would like to throw into the conversation and generally at everyone's heads. The conductor wrench, conductor fan fiction. Dodge! <laughs> <laughs> what you got? So, how do superhero how does superhero media fit into fantasy um yes oh boy for me i mean (laughs) superheroes have sort of become their own genre separate from fantasy in a -hmm. way and i feel like well if they ever were like in its infancy probably but it's got in enough of sort of everything else about it where superheroes as a genre you know you get your pure superhero and then there are subgenres of what a superhero means like what is the purest form of a superhero is it superman is that what we say so if someone was writing a superhero story are we looking at semi you know like a an alien that looks human and has these like powers along this line or are we looking like at a batman who is basically a guy who deals with like uh people who have you know the mentally ill of arkham um who you know do crazy stuff (laughs) i think uh it really depends on a case by case basis because, like, you look at something like um, Invincible. I wouldn't call that fantasy because it's all well, and I might be misremembering. So, actually, yeah, I have to think that I think this this explanation falls through because I was going to say it's all aliens or uh, like mutations, like the classic shit you see from like bit by radioactive spider from like the Golden Age. But at the same time, I think there is at least one dude who's like a demon, who's like a minor side character. So I was gonna say there is. I, I actually just recently rewatched part of Invincible. Um, yeah. There is a demon, but that, I would say that's also pretty classic. Yeah. Uh, Golden Age stuff. There but is, yeah. however, one dude who's just kind of there because smart, although he doesn't last very long. Uh, Darkwing. Yeah. Yeah. I. 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 I, I'm, I'm, I it's been a while since I've watched it, so I'm not familiar with that one. I forget on a blank. But yeah, I, I get what well, it's like. There are fantasy elements within certain superheroes. Uh, you know, you look at stuff like the Black Knight in Marvel, who is a character who is like, yeah, like my ancestors had a, a cursed sword or whatever. <laughs> and you're like, great. But I think ultimately, first off, a lot of those stories aren't very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, the most popular superheroes and all that, and sort of when you do look at what modern superheroes are, you know, if you're looking at fantasy, you are looking at something like Thor, which is, you know, depending on what Thor is up to, it's more sci fi sometimes, it's more fantasy sometimes, it, it all depends, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that that's like Schrodinger's fantasy right there, isn't it? Um, yeah, and that's yeah. and it's just what that's what superheroes are. Superheroes do anything. It's like, oh, you look at like just the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, it's like here we have a guy crime fighting in New York against uh, this like mafia stuff, and it's very limited on the um on the aspect of actual superhero, but then you get stuff like Doctor Strange (laughs) as well. And then you get multiversal stuff, you get Black Panther, you get so much, and you look at it and you go, you can't really define superheroes. You can make a fantasy superhero, you can't define superheroes as fantasy. I think at some point... Yeah, no, if it comes too broad, because I think... For one, like, you figure, like, even the ones who have supernatural magical powers, it's usually restricted to, like, a certain organization or bloodline. 
it's not like in, say, Wheel of Time where just anyone can randomly have the potential, or like in Stormlight where, uh, actually, you know, I'm only at the book three, so I'm not still entirely sure how things work beyond like bonding with a friend and then like maybe getting squired by uh, someone who's spoken the ideals. So, Spren bond, the, the Nahel bond has requirements to it. Okay. But the, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that there's, even in, I think it's just in superhero settings where you see magic, it's pretty restricted. Like, maybe not as much as, like, in a low fantasy setting where there's, like, five wizards in the whole universe and they're super powerful. But I think it tends to be a little more, like, it's less of something that's broadly applicable within the 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 laws of nature and physics within the universe, and it tends to be kind of restricted to, like, a single character or a single character's family. Wait. Or, or... Back that up. Back that up, okay. Did you just call Lord of the Rings low fantasy? I, not deliberately. No, I was thinking more of a different series. That's not where I was going with that one. Um... I accidentally so about five games, wizards, like. and they're all extremely powerful. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, no, I think we're getting to the does high fantasy, low fantasy mean high magic, low magic debate, and that is not for until, what, another two or three episodes? Uh, that's next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, we can, we'll, 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 we'll put a pin in that one for, for next time. <laughs> but yeah, looking, but that's what I would say when it comes to stuff like that, because how can you say, oh, this is like, like, you can say, like, a run of comics or a character, like, oh, this is heavily fantasy inspired or something. But you can, and, and, you know, if you have a superhero in a fantasy world, sure. But in, like, what we consider sort of modern superhero media, and obviously I'm very much layman. Uh, I hate comic books, especially most modern superhero comic books. I think you also they suck. You can't read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I can't read. But uh, convol- convoluted timelines, uh, you know, seven resets a decade. What what do you do? <laughs> yeah, uh, I I don't read superhero comic books, but there's some. Um, I hesitate to call them third party because that's it, it feels like a wrong usage of the terminology, but it gets the idea across. You mean like more independent studios outside the big two? <laughs> but I mean even more independent than that. Not even studio level. Like I'm talking books because. Uh, so you just that's mean- <laughs> generally my preferred medium. Individuals, individuals, individuals. <laughs> um, hmm. That's oh. where I get most of my superhero fix, uh, largely because that is where I get the queer stuff. And mm, <laughs> gimme, gimme. And the genuinely queer stuff, not the uh, not the corporatized shit that uh, gets plastered. The, the mass, the mass appeal stuff. Yeah, the, the stuff that is really genuinely queer, and that's that's the good shit. But but yeah, I you know I'm. A huge fantasy fan. Uh, I'm a big Fire Emblem fan. Son, you also are experienced bit in Fire Emblem. I, I am a very big fan of uh, Fire Emblem. Maybe um, that was you, but yes. Yes. Uh, me owning every Western Fire Emblem released. <laughs> uh, but it, it, there's also, you know, you get into like series tropes, you know. Where, like, Fire Emblem doesn't really have elves and never has in any sort of thing. Ah, well, it can't be fantasy then. (laughs) But it's like, oh, the final boss is a dragon. The semi-final boss is this dark wizard who has been manipulating the third biggest final boss, who is, like, this king who has been manipulated by the shadowy dark um, mage. Problem dragon. Yeah, and that's when we go into archetypes like that, and that's something I love about Fire Emblem, is the archetypes. Because in a gameplay sense and a um, story sense, it, you get the guy who occupies the same role, 
So there's a character called Jagan. Jagan is the older knight who starts out with better stats than the rest of your, uh, you know, starting units. He's usually a paladin on a horse, and he has high weapon level ranks and good stats, but he grows very slowly and has less to grow over the game, as opposed to your Cain and Abel, who are your Christmas calves, as in mm, you always have red a red and green. or a green one. Yep. <laughs> and they grow a lot quicker, uh, and obviously aren't g- as good as your Jagan at the start, but will surpass him eventually. And when you get into, like, tropes like that, and I'm sure if you look at an author's writing or certain sub-genres or certain series, you can also find stuff like that, where you go, huh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like, George R. R. Martin, everyone has an unrequited love. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's that dude's kink, by the way. He loves an unrequited love. Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so th- this, this is the, uh, the choosing violence moment I alluded to earlier pre-show, but since, since Dylan brought it up, uh, yeah. Ian, Ian and uh, Ian and Maya, what do you think Sanderson's uh, so-called uh, writer kink is, then? I don't feel like I'm qualified enough to say on that because I'm trying to think and I don't know that I'm sure it's there. It's just like he's probably hidden it so well I can't really pick up on what it is. Aside from, you know, having a super detailed magnetism. That is a hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that away for future podcasts. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> like, is there We're a putting us on the spot like this? <laughs> uh... Is there a recurring <laughs> element that appears often enough I mean, in Separate stories that you're like, huh? This again? <laughs> okay. Because oh, he—that's you know, the obligatory Sando show. I guess while we're here, is I think something he does pretty well is that he tends to voyeurism. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> because how, how... Floyd is in the background of every story, watching things happen. <laughs> mm, no mating. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that was this, this, this is a, this is this is the sort of shit that's good. You kill Maya. I hope you have this. Yeah, it's it's fine. She'll grow back. Um, th- this is the sort of shit that, that we get stand from Crepidosting. I forget what it was, and this is getting into the easy day. I forget what it was, but a while back, someone asked something about, like, I think it was about, like, if you could, like, if burning tin would have, like, an effect on, like, um, intimate interactions. And I forgot, was that or something else? But, like, Sanderson showed up in the Reddit threading just, like, you people. I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, it was He's either. He's a couple times, I think. It was either the burning tin or it was the Shardildo. <laughs> Honestly, it was oh, probably the dildo. I, it was probably that one because I could see him like gritting his teeth and answering the tin thing. Like I would. He did answer the tin one, and yes. yes, it would. Yes, I mean that makes sense. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, like the uh, extension. Um, we're not gonna go. <sighs> oh god. My parents are gonna <laughs> listen to this episode. Well, lucky that <laughs> Ian, you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> So in the Mistborn series, uh, the the Alamant oh, ability my, my to burn tin Mistborn. <laughs> it it enhances all your senses and touch is a sense. So extrapolate from there. <laughs> you're, 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 we assume you're from there. Um. So now that we completely derail the discussion, um. Oh no! I'm gonna be in the car when this episode airs. They they might be. We might be listening to this on our trip. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, God. Oh, God. Good luck. Amazing. <laughs> what a what a result. Okay, we're just, we're just just remember if you do need to eject from the if you do experience so much cringe that you need to eject from the car, remember to tuck your knee head towards your knees as you ball up twirl out. That way you're gonna less <laughs> likely to <laughs> either escape the car way. <laughs> okay, oh, so. <laughs> Bring things a little bit back on track. What are some of our favorite fantasy works? I'll I'll go first. I'll steal it. Go ahead. Um, well, I would say 
is obviously Fire Emblem is my favorite sort of fantasy. Uh, I love the degenerating dragons. <laughs> uh, I love my Christmas calves. I love my dark wizards. I love my anima, my light and dark magic. Elder, if you're a big Knoss fan. <laughs> uh, but I just love the setting, what the Fire Emblem itself is in multiple games, whether it's a medallion, a sword, or just a shield. I love them all. Um, and the, I just love, like a Final Fantasy, that a Fire Emblem game stands on its own within a series of other games. And I think that's something that is always like, an aspiration to mine is have something where it's like, these have similar elements, these have a similar story structure, but they're all unique in their own way. Uh, there's other things I want to bring up, but uh, I do want to save them for a different upcoming episode where I want to discuss those. So I'll leave it there and just say Fire Emblem. <laughs> I guess I'll go next. Um... Lord of the Rings, of course. Uh, I, of course. I think The Hobbit might be one of the first, like, adult-level books I've ever read. And I, I do think that the Lord of the Rings movies by Peter Jackson are better than the original trilogy. Although, little little sad that Tom Bombadil got left out, but I can see why. <laughs> um, I'm... Also, I would say conditionally a fan of Star Wars, and I'm counting that as a fantasy setting. Don't at me. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you're not wrong. You can find his Twitter at in the uh, following what? pages of the Fan Fiction Tapes Twitter. Absolutely at him. Why are you booing him? He's right. I mean, it is more science fiction, but he, he is right. Yeah, I, I'm mostly just encouraging shenanigans. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Just a word of warning, anyone who comes at me with a wrong opinion is getting sent to the willows. <laughs> Ominous. <laughs> Joke's on you, I don't know any coffee shops in North Carolina. <laughs> I'm the wrong side of the Atlantic for that joke. Do you have any others you want to add, or do you want me to go next? Dresden Files. Oh god, yes. Um, I'll let you go, but that's one of mine. I th I think that's shared by everybody here but Dylan. Because Dylan can't. Dylan, read Dresden <laughs> Files. Or listen to them. James Learn... Marsters is delightful. You won't have to read. I feel bullied. <laughs> They're good. Very good. Mm. You'll understand my D&D &D characters more if you read them. Yeah, but I, I listen to plenty of good stuff too, and you guys are like... <laughs> <laughs> Just because your good thing is more popular. <laughs> I, Honestly, you're the one I, who likes Game of Thrones. Also, okay, A, yes, and B, if you mean Critical Role, I think it might actually be more popular than Dresden Files. Not not that I have anything against Critical Role, but that does hurt me a little. Oh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm I, I don't think there's stuff. much might to it. I'm pretty certain it is. It's quite popular. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm uh, just like, come on. I've been banging on about Xenoblade for about half a decade now. Still no one's biting? I got, I got it, one person to bite. <laughs> to be fair, like, I feel like past a certain age, uh, saying, hey, get invested in this JRPG that's like 60 plus hours is a big ask, even if it is genuinely good. Like, hey, I still I'm don't... not asking them that. I'm asking them to get invested in five JRPGs. <laughs> <laughs> With See, about, like, <laughs> like for about 400 hours. <laughs> Sure. I don't like my games to have story at all. That seems like a you issue. <laughs> so Spectres and Dwarf Fortress, got it. Dwarf Fortress, exactly. Dwarf Fortress is probably the game I've put the most hours into. <laughs> Literally. Son, do you have any fantasy favorite fantasy works you'd like to share? And a couple for medium. Um, it's funny because I, I have this... I can think of so many things I like, but it's hard for me to like pick, like, Anything beyond the top ten. Um, in terms of fantasy, though, I mean, we we've touched on Dresden Files. It's uh, so I won't go too much about that, but I think it's a nice blend of 
Booker, admittedly, I think he even said in an interview once he basically just went to like I think like the occult like woo section of his local Barnes and Nobles and like binged a lot of that before he wrote the first three books. Um, and I think he not to continue. Uh, not to retread old ground, but old J.K. Rowling thing, I think he does a better job of playing with pre-existing folklore and lore than uh, than she did. And especially because, yeah. like, especially because, like, he does a lot of really fun stuff intersecting with the, the our world, which is important urban fantasy. It's not. That's one of those things he doesn't necessarily do often, but like when he does, it's pretty funny. Like case in point. Um, how like the uh, he meets this goat, or he's like a demon or a fae, and finds out that like he's kind of responsible for the curse of the cubs. And well, spoiler alert for anyone who cares about this, since it's seventeen books in and it's been out for two years. But one of the the low key funniest like you blinking you miss in the moment you look back later and you like you motherfucker he did that was he spent so long between running skin game and uh, peace talks and battleground that. Uh, the Cubs won again uh, the World Series where people care about baseball. I personally don't. And so when uh, this Titan shows up out of nowhere to just kind of just generally be an asshole to everyone in Chicago, she throws a severed head of this goat down, and he's just subtly implying she helped the Cubs win the World Series by lifting the curse. But uh, it's like weird shit like that. Um, But Again, we all kind of mentioned Grass and Maybe that's an episode at some point. Um, in terms does. of books... I kind of care about baseball, and I missed that. And to be fair, I had to have it pointed out to me. Like, kind of like when, uh... He, he like, be, like, I realized the, the pun behind uh, Flick and Vickers. But again, I was an audio-only guy, because I, that's how I started the series, and that's how I want to end it. Um, so it's that's an easy one to miss if you're not reading it on the page. Uh, another book, it's not really... Technically, there's a sequel, but it's it's not. A, it's I think it's only gonna be like a loose trilogy. Is something I've shelved for these guys before is Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Eames, which takes the idea of like, hey, you know how everybody calls these people bands of adventures? What if we treated them in universe like actual bands? And it's basically uh, about. I don't read a lot of books about retired adventures getting back to the game, but it's weird that it's happening twice. Um, it's basically about the guy who, this guy named Clay Cooper, who's kind of seen as, like, the bassist of his band of adventures back in the day. They were the biggest monster-slaying badasses in the entire realm. And in the sense that he uses a shield and, like, some other nondescript weapon. And so it's not flashy, but whenever he's not around, the group kind of falls apart. So uh, the guy who's kind of, like, their leader, he shows up and is like, hey, you know, my kid, she got her own band together, and... They've been doing great, but they're behind siege under all these monsters, like, way across the kingdom. Like, I need you, me, you, me, need to get the guys back together and save them. And it ends up being this really fun, tongue-in-cheek romp that can go from being just goofy as hell to, like, surprisingly sad in, in, a, at the, in the blink of an eye. And it, but it's just a really fun comfort read if you're looking for something that's not super complex. Um... I know you've shilled that one to me before, and it is still on my um, TBR list, but <laughs> I do want to say, as a bassist, I feel that. Uh, I This episode has tempted me to spend so much money on books, and I, I have so many books <laughs> I need to finish reading first. I've got, like, four with me that I need to finish. It's the reader's curse. The the, the two-read list never ends. Um, So I'll I'll pivot to video game. Well, the one thing I'm going to say about Kings of the Wild before I continue is uh, if you also, as Ian kind of mentioned about feeling it in his bones, there's a lot of nice little rock history themed jokes there if you know where to look. Um, Pivoting away from things that won't tempt my to spend money, um, like Dylan and I like Fire Emblem, it's a... Uh, it, it's... I tend to like the story more. He's kind of tucked in how it's very archetypical. I tend to like the support conversations more because the the conversation between the characters are not the main attraction, but I think the writing tends to be better there. It's kind of interesting to see these people just get a peek into their lives in the in this world of living, whether it's Plegia or Elise or whatever setting it is within the series. Uh, I do fortunately think that the user interface for them is f atrocious until, pardon my language, until 
uh, Awakening, but that's a separate issue. Um, and also for the D&D crowd, um, Marshalls end up usually being the better character. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in, also, and it's partially me speaking to nostalgia because I was introduced to Fire Emblem 7, a.k.a. the first one of the West, at an impressionable age via Lynn. Um, and again, speaking of nostalgia, I've actually got some friends of these like you might place. Uh, another old classic RPG for that generation of Game Boy was uh, Golden Sun. It uh, It's primarily like a, a four Greek elements magic system, which people will kind of criticize as being overdone, and well, they're not wrong, but I, I like that stuff, so they, and it's basically about magic is sealed away in this world. It's people would still use it, but it's not as much as it, not as prevalent as it was during the Golden Age. And uh, one day people come to this temple and steal the stars, which are basically these artifacts that kind of like are keys to these four lighthouses throughout the world, which would unlock the corresponding element. And that just tends to start causing problems from there. Then they, they kind of set out to fix it after a little time skip. And it's partway through the game, you, you start to realize, okay, actually, no, sorry, I'm getting my timeline mixed up here. It's been, like, way too long since I've played those. In the second game, it kind of follows a somebody who was an antagonist in the first game and a few other people. And it starts to kind of raise the question, okay, is stopping people from lighting the lighthouses actually going to fix things, or do they actually need to light them to cause a stop an even worse apocalypse from happening? And it, it's it's a fun little run through, uh, through that sort of uh, interior sort of standard JRPG setting, but one of the things that kind of sets up our gameplay wise is you can use a lot of the spells outside of combat, and that ends up being very important for the puzzle game, so if that's your jam, and you like top-down pseudo three puzzle RP turn-based RPGs. I would recommend that one. And I love how we went through this entire series without mentioning possibly the biggest fantasy video game. Which one? <laughs> the Legend of Zelda. <laughs> yeah, Zelda's good too. It, it's not one of my. It's not as I've gotten older. It's still not one of like my core memory series, but I have. I've enjoyed several Zelda games, but I don't get like super deep into lore like some people. I, I I'm a bad Zelda fan. I haven't even played Breath of the Wild beyond like a couple hours at my friend's place. So we also didn't mention Elder Scrolls. <laughs> oh god, no! I, the Elder Scrolls is like I've seen Skyrim. I know I would like it. It probably would. The not problem is you would like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank, there we go. Yeah. Hey, I, I need to pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've played a bit of Skyrim, but I came into Skyrim about ten years too late, mm -hmm. and so it was like, eh, there's more entertaining stuff for me to do. Yeah. Like in terms of fantasy video games, I think really the only one that I could recall really particularly enjoying is probably like Hollow Knight. I don't play a lot of fantasy video games, but my video games trend a lot more towards sci-fi and modern. So what 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 other fantasy series have been kind of similar to to central to your experience? Right. Um well we talked about several of them, Dresden Files, um Lord of the Rings. That's kind of why I wanted to go last was I could actually I was hoping that Ian would mention the Cosmere and then I could get to gush about Dresden Files, but I was surprised that he went for Dresden Files. But Cosmere obviously is it's the Cosmere. <laughs> yes. Which, uh, for, for the uninitiated, which, it, if you've somehow not figured that out through this podcast, uh, you must have miss, missed a few, but it's Brandon Sanderson's shared universe that links the vast majority of the series together in a way that is surprisingly uh, forgiving of having not read all the series, mostly. I think that's been changing with a few recent ones. Uh, y you can still get a good experience out of it with... With I think pretty much all of them, but uh, Rhythm of War, uh, no, not Rhythm of War. Um, the Lost Metal, uh, the, the Last Metal, 
Whatever the title of the, the newest metal. metal. Thank you. Lost Metal. I had it right at first. That's really the only one where there's any amount of punishment for not having read the others. All of the other books, and there's like 15 previous books in the series. All of the other books, if you haven't read the other books, it's fine. That's really the first one where it kind of matters if you haven't read it. Which is why I'm sad, because I bought that like a week or two after it came out because I had a gift card and like I, it is still like sitting on my shelf because I haven't read Rhythm of War yet. But I got like a book and a half left if you're you're counting Dawn Shards, so. Dawn Shards pretty short. Um, but also th- other notable mentions, uh, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, that series was a large influence on me as a kid. Um, uh, and it's that was really the first urban fantasy series that I read, and I loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. Um, and Artemis Fowl as well, another urban fantasy series that I read as a kid. Both of those are pretty well and hold up surprisingly, you know, for me as an adult compared to how they read when I was uh, a kid. But I think those those were. I don't know if... Is Ranger's Apprentice, for those of you familiar with it, is that even fantasy? It kind of is, I guess. Kind of. It's not... Oh! I, um... I I pulled up my uh, Nook app because I knew I was going to forget about this. Otherwise, Raymond E. Feist, his uh, Rift War cycle, in particular, the book Magician, which is nowadays usually split into Magician Apprentice and Magician Master... That, hmm, good fantasy. I like. I actually need to get my copies of the books back. Which I, uh, I think you might have recommended some of this stuff to me once, and I, I seem to remember, like, yeah, I seem to remember looking him up. Didn't he like? I don't know if it was uh, Rift War or something else, but didn't he base like some of his books off a of D and D campaign? That is, yeah. I believe, Rift War specifically. Okay. Um, and it's it's good. It, you can kind of tell a little bit when reading it some of. Some of the uh, character progressions are fairly typical TTRPG fare, which isn't a bad thing. I happen to like that, being a uh, chronic TTRPG player. So when you say typical progression, I, I how, what do you mean by that when you're talking about translating it to, to, to a literature context? Uh... Oh, gosh. It, it's hard to even put it into words outside of that. There, there's one particular character I'm thinking of where it's... You look at his character arc and you're like, yeah, that's a D&D character. He's like a real slow, slow, gradual arc, or...? Uh, not even necessarily that, but just... Uh, spoilers for the book, obviously, but... He starts out as an orphan, mm-hmm. acquires... um magical gear through trauma uh becomes kind of spooky paladin and uh gets the girl of course i mean it's not like it's not just like a hero's journey though um kind of it's a little different he's not even the main character Mm -hmm. he is actually the main character's best friend but just yeah i i can't really explain it very well but uh, after having read it and learning that, oh, this came from a D&D game, it was just obvious. Uh, so, uh, why don't we, uh, wrap up here, Maya? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Ian, do we have anything in the mailbag? Um, we don't have any new mail this week. Big thank you to everybody who has gotten in touch with us. If there is anything that you would like to tell us, share with us, uh, if you would like to give us many compliments for the uh, <laughs> entertainment you get from the ADHD Talking Hour, uh, our email address <laughs> is fanfictapes at gmail.com. Uh, you can also leave a comment on our YouTube channel or leave us a rating on and review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify. We do enjoy the dopamine we get from seeing those five stars. 
Uh, yes. You can also reach out to us on Twitter. Maya runs our Twitter account. Uh, that is at Fanfiction Tapes with a capital F, capital T, in the usual places you would expect capital letters. Uh, we tweet about episodes on there, and usually there is I talk a little bit about um, some of, something a little bit about the process of what we did recording it. Usually, just like oh, this one was really fun to do. We did this, uh, and I'll sometimes use hashtags. If you send us something on there that you'd like us to include on the show. Uh, we'll absolutely see what we can do to uh, include that. I check that fairly frequently. That, that'll probably be discussed for the soonest possible episode. And we will continue to use Twitter as long as the Hell site remains um, usable. The Hell site derogatory. Yes. Here, not, not Hell site affectionate. That would be Tumblr. Ooh, maybe one of us should make a fan fiction tape side blog. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Well, uh, before we get going, Son, do you have anything you'd like to promote uh, of yours before we go? Uh, not the moment. I, uh, I do write. Uh, I'm also just kind of getting back into the groove of it after a kind of a you know, battle spell for a while. Um, I guess promote my crack theory by Sir Metric, uh, Lancer's Fantasy. I'm going to argue about this with Steam later. <laughs> I hope you know that. Mm. I'm going to argue with this about with you about this later. <laughs> Before we go on for another five minutes, I am and have been Maya, and I was joined today by... Always joined by Dylan. Bye, Tom. And I am Ian. Until next time, bye! <laughs>